Today we have Mike Lamman with us. Um, Mike founded a company called Ripple IT in 1997, and he dedicated himself to two propositions. The first is that IT should be about serving people instead of about computers. And the second is that people should have the freedom to do their best work. Um, and it's those two propositions and more that led him to 15 years of creating a successful hybrid workplace. So as of late, I know we've all been hearing about hybrid workplaces and experience that. It's become more prevalent than ever. Um, but what does that look like? How do you create one? What technology will keep your team healthy and aligned? How do you ensure that your employees are successful? That is what Mike here is here to talk to us about. Um, he's going to discuss the highs and lows of the 15 years that led to his success and then forecast what these changes could look like over the next 15 we also have a special guest with us today. Her name is Kristen McLean. Um, she's with the Vivid Inc. Company, and she and her company or, uh, transform the spoken word into lasting and actionable works of art. So essentially, she will have like a drawing for us that will represent and go with today's webinar. Welcome, Kristen. And then without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Mike take it away. Side note, this is an interactive session. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat and a Q&A box. Please use those up. Ask us all the questions. Um, yeah, Mike, go ahead. All right, awesome. Well, thanks. That was a super nice introduction. Um, I am going to just kind of get into it and not talk too much about myself until maybe in the middle of the presentation. Um, so basically, I'm just going to talk today about uh, my company, a little bit's experience with Row, uh, what I think is the new normal, and a little bit about what I think is next, and kind of just try to tie that into the experience that I've had. So if any of you are NEO, Entrepreneurs Organization, you'll kind of know about how, how that organization deals with sharing experiences, and that's mostly what I wanna, what I wanna do. Um, so first of all, um, my company is Ripple. We're a 26 person company. So if that looks anything like your company, then maybe these experiences will, will resonate. Um, but basically when we talk about Row, I just wanna make sure everybody's kind of on the same page with what is Row. Um, and basically uh, it stands for results only work environment. Um, and it's a, a workplace where so long as the work gets done, you can work where and when you choose. Um, it's really built around autonomy and accountability, um, not lots of rules and deciding where people need to be and when they need to be there. Um, it takes really just an attitude of uh, adults being presumed to be adults. Um, I find that very few other relationships other than sort of boss subordinate have two adults that then check in on each other all of the time and, and tell people how to do stuff. And I've found that the work environment's really not so different. Um, and some of the highlights or the parts that often do get discussed about if you have heard about Row is, you know, it, it's usually paired with unlimited vacation time, you know, no PTO rules, uh, no sick day rules, um, and basically a, a way of really blending uh, your personal and professional time as you see fit. Um, those are often kind of the headlines that attracted people to row, you know, before before COVID hit and, and all the stuff that uh, that we're dealing with now, which has changed the game quite a bit for for everybody. Um, so I, would, I do want to just kind of put a little set of stage too, so we're all kind of clear on sort of where where I think we are today. Maybe that'll help you make sense of what I my presumptions are or whatever. Um, but but I see this as we're sort of 18 months into a, a massive row experiment. Um, at minimum, we're 18 months into a big remote working experiment. And a big part of Row is often remote, although Row doesn't necessarily mean remote. It's where you work that you get your best work accomplished, but that often is coupled with people working from home or working from, from somewhere else. Um, what I think we're seeing now, a year or so into this, is that uh, most workers, and I'm typically here talking about office type of work, you know, software companies, ad agencies and so forth. I mean, this is not as much for restaurants or theaters or you know, meat packing plants or whatever, but uh, workers are relishing and we're seeing them now demanding uh, this newfound freedom. Um, I do not think that this is going to be relinquished uh, easily by people. Um, I've also seen, we're all seeing employers have adapted and a lot of times have been thriving in this environment. And I think that is probably not something people would have predicted if you'd said this was going to happen in June of 2019. I think, uh, I think that companies have adapted and thrived as well as they have is uh, super encouraging and maybe a little surprising. Um, and I think we're starting to also see uh, some potential pushback um, back to the old norm. A lot of people talking about getting everybody in the workplace, 
you know, opening up the doors and whatnot. And I think that is driven by a lot of things. Um, I don't want to presume to speak for anybody's particular workplace, but I think there are some factors in there that are like sunk costs. You know, we have this huge expensive office. It seems weird to just abandon it. Um, I think there's a lot of tradition around what work is. I mean, we, we've all grown up in a world where we just say we're going to work. It's synonymous with place. Um, and I think a longing for some pretty legitimate intangibles. There are things that happen when people are physically together that are good and we like those things. And so we're all trying to weigh what's the value of those intangibles um, with, with the reality that more people want to work remotely. Um, so what we have, this is an old slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this stuff because you all know this already. Um, you know, we have these two sides of the market and we've kind of had a luxury for a long time as employers where there weren't a whole lot of demands from, from the labor side. But this has become a huge, huge thing uh, for people who have been working remotely for a year. Uh, they've made up their minds. This, this is from January of last year, uh, or of this year rather. And you know, six months later, even more people are convinced that they want to be able to have a more freedom-based workplace. Specifically, people are asking questions and answering questions about remote work. Um, but I think that remote work and the other qualities that go into a row are pretty, pretty inexorably tied up. And people have made up their minds like with their feet. Um, now, surveys don't always tell what people will actually do, but we are seeing what everyone's calling, you know, the great reshuffling and so forth. People are making, uh, they're making good on their desire to have remote work environments and they are leaving uh, jobs that they think won't, won't meet those, those demands. And so it puts us all in this big, huge, massive experiment. Uh, and we're all trying to figure out, you know, the best way to move forward. So that kind of got me to like, why would I be qualified to even have this discussion with you? I'm surely not the first person or webinar that you've, that has addressed remote work or hybrid work environments or, or any of that stuff. Um, but probably the thing that gives me some reason that I maybe can do this is that we've been doing this since 2007. This slide you can't see, but it doesn't matter. This is an old, article that I wrote, you know, in 2009 about results only work environment uh, and, and how that was really helping our workplace and so forth. So I've been able to do this in times that weren't crisis times. We've done it, we've had ups and downs, we've perfected it or not perfected it, but I just mean we've, we've done this in times that weren't imposed upon us. And I think there are some lessons and some things that come from that, from being able to have done, done it in a more considered way uh, that, that may be pertinent as we're all trying to figure out what work environment we want going forward. So now I'll just get to a little bit about us so you can understand where, where maybe my company fits and whether or not my experience is relevant to you. Um, my company is Ripple. We manage IT for other companies. So if you're a 50 person ad agency, you would pay us a subscription fee and we'd take care of your security and your networking and your desktop support and your cloud servers and whatever all that kind of stuff is, you probably would use us instead of having an IT department. Uh, we were founded in 1997. Um, so if you kind of do that math, the first 10 years of my company looked pretty traditional. I mean, we had, everyone came to the office and we had PTO rules and all that stuff. And about the other half of my work career has been uh, spent in a row. So I have, you know, some experience with both. Um, and, you know, some, some comparisons that I can draw from having gone through that. Uh, we today have 26 employees. We've had anywhere in that time period between 15 and maybe 40 employees. Um, and we have basically two locations, uh, which aren't really locations anymore, but most of our customers are in Atlanta and New York City, and maybe 10 or 20% of them are just from other places around the country. Uh, so before, I'll just, has it worked? Uh, you know, like would be the big, I guess, first question. And, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in 14 years. So I can't say, oh, the only Delta here was Roe, but I can tell you that it hasn't not worked. Okay. So one of the big, I think, fears about taking a leap like this is like, is it going to break everything? Can, can a company survive with little sort of supervision and control? Um, so I can tell you what has happened in those, in those uh, 13 years. Um, we've grown, we're about five times the size we were uh, in 2007. We're 10 times more profitable. Um, and maybe of the most interest of this is we've done three acquisitions in that time period. So 
technically I've sort of taken four companies from being non-ROWs to being ROWs. So none of the three companies that, that we bought were a results only work environment. Um, they were all uh, a little bit more traditional, all cool and flexible workplaces. I mean, these weren't, you know, terrible, terrible workplaces or anything like that, but they weren't not, were, they were not rows. And so there was resistance, natural resistance that came from leadership, that came from, from rank and file, normal people in, in the workforce. Um, and we've kind of navigated that so sort of four times now. Um, we've had very low voluntary turnover in that time period. I mean, between 2008 and I suppose last year, uh, we probably had four people that voluntarily left in that, in that time period. Um, and we had minimal to almost no pandemic disruption other than the actual pandemic part, but the workplace part, how we worked, did our customers even know? I mean, most of that was, was seamless. Um, and that's been true of other uh, sort of disasters as well, you know, whether it was a hurricane or a snow storm or whatever, um, the resiliency of having a, a mostly remote or certainly remote able workforce uh, allowed us to get through uh, the pandemic in a pretty seamless way, which was, which was great. Um, so let me go back to a little bit of like, so before all this, what I found us spending a lot of energy on, one of the reasons I ended up uh, embracing results only work environment was this was just places I didn't enjoy spending my energy and I didn't really enjoy um, watching my team spend their energy as well. So it was for me kind of easy to scrap it. We had a lot of proxies for work. Um, we used to do you know, performance reviews where we talked about were people on time, were they coming, staying late, were they, did they have their butts in the seat, were they taking too many sick days, we were counting all that stuff and making policies for it. And, uh, and they were really abstractions of what we wanted to be measuring. We also found that almost all of those things when we were measuring them, we were actually measuring them for people who were non-performers. So we didn't really notice or care how many sick or vacation days uh, a person who was performing would take. Nobody paid much attention to that, but we paid a lot of attention to it with non-performers. And we would use those proxies to try to sort of jostle them forward, but every one of those proxies was at least one abstraction away from what we just wanted them to get accomplished. And so we saw, I'm sure you've all seen, there are plenty of people who show up at 8.30 and leave at 6.30. They're there all day and they're wearing the right clothes and they get absolutely nothing accomplished. And there are people that seem to flit about as they feel like doing and, and they get lots accomplished. You know, the, the whole concept to me was wasn't all that foreign. There were already people that were living in a row. I was living in a row. You live in a row. Uh, you might go to work or check in because you feel guilty or because you want to set an example. But in reality, nobody is questioning you and where you spend your time. And if you went to the doctor or if you went to your kid's recital or something, salespeople mostly have this luxury as well. People don't really pay a whole lot of attention to them. Maybe they're at lunch, maybe they're golfing, maybe they're on the phone, maybe they're doing emails. But if they're getting the results, we didn't have a lot of rules uh, around those folks. And we found ourselves just churning out all these weird policies in response. So like when we were 10 people, I probably went years before I had my first maternity or paternity request. And we're like, I don't know, you know, and then we had to make a policy for it. And then we tried to figure out what the next thing that would happen. Did we have to have a bereavement policy and, and all this stuff. And we, we just found ourselves chugging away at stuff that didn't seem very, very important. So when we did all that, we had to figure out what we would measure. And um, we had to start measuring what we always should have been measuring, which was outcomes. And I don't say that flippantly. I mean, we still have a hard time measuring this. Uh, measuring outcomes is super hard, um, but it's less hard with the reduced abstraction. When we take away all the things that aren't particularly tied to those outcomes, we can focus more on what we want the outcomes to be. And we can focus teams more on what we want team outcomes to be and let individual teams sort of negotiate how they wanna get, how they wanna get their work done. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what row is not. Um, and this is something we've struggled with over those years. So I don't wanna make it sound like we turned on the row switch and everything was great and we've never had anybody question it and there's never been any problems. I mean, that's just not the case, but that wasn't the case in the old system either. I mean, when you have 30 human beings interacting, there's no, uh, there's no perfect system. Um, but what it isn't is doing whatever you want, whenever you want, okay? It's working where you want and when you want, so long as the work gets done. So 
the work gets done is really the first part. And then you deciding how you want to accomplish that, that's up to you. And it's also not rejecting commitments. You know, if there needs to be a meeting or a client needs to meet with you or any of those things, we're not saying that you can just decide not to show up to a meeting you committed to. Um, it's giving you the maximum freedom within that, just like most entrepreneurs have to make up their decisions about how they want to do their schedule or how they don't want to do their schedule as long as those outcomes uh, get met. Um, I'll just get to this part right now so it will otherwise come up and I'm happy to answer any questions about it when the time comes, but there's, a, there's an endless list of whatabouts that will happen that I went through, that I still go through, that are natural to this process, okay? And the, the biggest one is unlimited PTO, you know, what if people abuse that? People are, you know, how do I decide? What if someone wants to take four months off or, or what have you? So that, uh, will too many people take time off at the same time? What about our business hours? Is, is it fair? Can one person do it one way and one person do it another way? And what will the resentments be and all that? So I won't get into every scenario for that, but I will say in those 14 years, I can think of two times and I can't even really remember specifically what they were where I thought, man, this is a little extra. You know, someone's kind of pushing and tweaking, you know, this time off situation, maybe in, in, in a way that makes me uncomfortable. But that's across over 10 years, probably 80 people have come in and out of my company and I can maybe come up with a couple of times where I felt like someone took five days off too many. And even that's just sort of a judgment call. And when you add up all those man hours and that's my cat uh, and all that stuff, you will, it, it's not even a rounding error to be worried about versus the energy that we spent trying to figure out what was the exact specific kind of PO, PTO rules we should have and sick time and, and all this other stuff. Um, another thing that we'll talk a little bit later is, is fairness. There's no fairness really in the sense of some roles require some things and the others don't. So we do a lot of technical support and most of our technical support needs to happen when our clients choose to be working. And that is still even today, mostly nine to five. So if you're a technical support person, you can't always choose to work at three o'clock in the morning because we're not getting calls at three o'clock in the morning. But if you're a copywriter, you kind of can work at three o'clock in the morning. And those are like career choices people make. Doctors can do things firemen can't do and, and so forth. So that level of fairness is, is a meta fairness that is just not within our control. What we do within that is we try to make sure that we're being fair to individuals and people, but people will get hung up on the idea of what if this person is allowed to do that and I'm not allowed to do that. And that's, that's a real tension to be navigated. Uh, that has never you know, gone away completely um, and sometimes pops its head back up you know, more acutely than others um, when people have certain perceptions. But I will say in the old system, we had to do all sorts of stuff, all kinds of exceptions. You know, Someone would be out of vacation days in November and then their dad would get sick and they needed to take three weeks off. And so, I don't know, some companies might just say pound sand and take a leave of absence, but most small companies I know would be like, oh my God, you know, take the time you need and don't worry about it. Uh, and so why even bother with all, the, with all the rules that you then have to try to figure out how to break them was our sort of thing. And our experience with that's been pretty good. Um, I'll just kind of take you to pandemic. Um, so uh, we have experienced this as well. Um, a lot of it, like I said, hasn't really changed for us. You know, we didn't have to worry about sending everybody home and we didn't have to worry about how would, how would they get their work done. Uh, we gave people as many materials as we thought would be helpful. We just said, take your cool office chairs and all this other stuff. But basically, no, no customer would have been affected and most of our team mostly worked from home anyway. Um, but something we did do that I thought was interesting and I think is interesting math for anybody who's kind of contemplating what the new world looks like is our lease happened uh, to end during right at the beginning in like the end of March of 2020 and uh, I decided not to renew it and we kind of shuttled into a little co-working space even though nobody went there but we moved all our stuff there and uh, it's a lot of money. Um, if I just equalized it for $2019 and we had not paid that same rent in 2019, that would have been 20% more profit dollars. Um, you know, that is not rounding error money. I mean, that is like most people would really perk up if you said, I've got something with some pros and some cons, but it can save you. It can add 20% to your bottom line. You, you would probably listen to that. 
uh, I don't foresee us really ever going back. Um, and we're happy to spend that money elsewhere on uh, teams and on tools and, and all kinds of other stuff. We also have a bunch of new people that have never met anyone in person. Uh, for as remote as we were, you know, we still did lots of in-person stuff and people still sometimes came to the office and, you know, maybe we'd have a big meeting or something like that. So we've, we've learned to navigate the social implications of people who have never met and may never meet each other. You know, it's conceivable that, that we will hire people from all around that just might not meet each other or might meet each other every so once in a while. Uh, and then what we kind of learned, which was, I think, true beforehand, but it was so acute over the last year and a half because of so much tension and stress that people were going through, which is its support. I mean, interpersonal support between leaders and middle managers and, and employees became far and away the most important thing. The gestures and the listening and the, all the things that go along with one-on-one -on -one interpersonal support that doesn't have a rule and doesn't have a norm uh, became extremely valuable and I think was really valuable to people. Uh, people really care about if, if they work for a place that cares about them. And one of the things that we probably did even more of in, the, in, the, in this last year and a half is to really spend time supporting each other. Uh, and that is probably not gonna go away either. Um, so, okay, will rural work for you? I don't know if rural will work for you. Um, you know, this is obviously something everybody is trying to figure out is what is their new work environment going to look like. Um, but I do have some kind of thoughts about it and I have what I think are four buckets of what I've seen uh, in how companies have been able to endure the last year and a half. So like I said, my experience is mostly with office type of, of work. Uh, and so one of the buckets is total collapse, you know, really just had a real negative effect on productivity, maybe because you're a restaurant or something that really requires the thing be delivered in person. And I probably have a lot less to offer there. I would still say though, if you're a restaurant, you're competing against other restaurants, not software companies. So if you have the most freedom-based workplace and the most caring workplace and the most trust-based workplace, you're probably still going to attract better people, you know, than, than the restaurant that doesn't do that. But a lot less of this is, is, a lot less in my experience is probably ap applicable here. But I've seen the other three uh, buckets as well. And those buckets are, our productivity was slightly worse, our productivity was about the same, and our productivity, our productivity was better. And so if your productivity was better, I'm not really sure what, you know, maybe just some strong yearning of tradition of having a physical, you know, workplace and making everyone go there, maybe that's just appealing to you and this your company, so do what you want. Um, but if, you're, if you've been more productive, I would think most people would take a real consideration of maybe this works pretty well. I would say that about people who are about the same as well. I mean, if you've been able to go through this and imposed work shift, right? Not one you thought about, not one you planned out, not one you had any time to navigate, and you've basically fared about the same, that bodes pretty well as well. And I think actually the same of people who have had slightly worse productivity for that reason. It's like, if your first at bat was a triple, you would not think I could never hit a home run. And if you've gone through this totally imposed work environment and you've only slightly had it slightly worse with some time and some consideration and some thought, you might find that you end up, you know, in a better place. I think about it like this, which is since the day I became an entrepreneur, I thought endlessly all the time about physical workplace, you know, should it look like this? Should we have snacks? Should it be an open plan? Should it be a kind of an open plan? Should there be flexibility? I mean, we just think endlessly about the furniture, everything, because we think there is some gain to, to be had there. And we've thought about it forever. And we've basically thought about this for, you know, six months. Uh, you know, the first six months, I don't think anybody was really thinking about it. They were just reacting to it. And maybe the past six months, a bunch of us have given it some thought. Um, but physical workplaces have been a total obsession of entrepreneurs and uh, distributed workplaces less so. And I think at minimum, it requires or deserves the same kind of attention and thought about all of the details and particulars of how one might design uh, a workplace. And to me, what I think is if you just think about it, if you reset, and we've all kind of been reset, is the office is just a tool and work is what you accomplish. 
And if you think about the office not as the central focus of how work should get done, and it's just a tool, to me, many people will think about it as like, when should I use that tool? How much of that tool is necessary? How expensive should that tool be? As opposed to it just being like a tool that's just always there and was omnipresent. Um, so I was kind of waltz through some what I think about the future with the caveat of, of course, that I don't really know anything about the future, um, but I probably pay attention to this as much as anybody. And I do have some thoughts about it. And having gone through the past, I think gives me a little bit of insight as to um, what, how we might deal with, with the future. Um, this is a quote I actually just saw in this article about, are we all gonna go back to work or are we all not gonna go back to work and, and how people feel about it, particularly employees more so than leadership. Um, but what people have seen is, is something we've experienced a long time, which is that remote work or row work, it exposes people who actually accomplish things and it keeps it takes away a lot of the hiding places for people who are just good at diplomacy and good at navigating how to look busy and, and, and other things like that. And so I think whole swaths of people, maybe people who weren't particularly great at all the inner office politics stuff are like, hey, I'm getting a lot of work done and there's no way for this to, you can't hide that. And I don't have to be an incredible diplomat for you to see the work that I'm getting done. I don't have to look busy or, or dress the part or whatever. Um, so when I think about, I think about like, what are the new, what are the things we kind of need to consider uh, in the new world of work? This world where there's a workforce that wants and is to some level demanding either a hybrid workplace or remote workplace, what they're really asking for is autonomy to work where and when they want to, where they think they can be effective. So what I think, is going to be exposed or what people are going to feel like if you've had a workplace that's done pretty well over the past year and people are like, Hey, I want to work remotely or I want to work in a hybrid work environment. And you're like, everybody back to the office. From their perspective, they're like, why, you know, if we've been doing pretty well, maybe better than before, maybe just a little bit worse than before, what would be the reason for going back? So people will perceive that in many cases as just a naked, exercise in authority because I said so, I'm the boss, get back, get back to the office. And I think people naturally reject exercises in naked authority, whether that's how it's intended or not, I think that is how it will be perceived. And the people that reject that the most are typically the best people that you wanna keep on staff that have choices. And people that really don't mind naked authority are generally weaker and they are not necessarily the people you would want to pick to be on your team. So understanding or thinking about how this will be perceived by people when you're telling them they need to come back in the workplace, there better be what they perceive as a pretty good reason or they will, they will be exploring their options. Uh, people now really know the value of an extra 10 hours of personal time a week. I think people sometimes worked from home before or it was great and they didn't you know, miss traffic or whatever, but it just wasn't presumed that this was really a way that they could work, that they could sort of demand to work. And we're basically saying things are about the same, but I want you to give up 10 of your personal hours per week to get in a car and get dressed and drive to work and da -da -da -da, sit at the coffee machine. And then I want you to go home and do all this stuff. And I think the value of 10 hours a week, like 20% of their work time uh, has become incredibly uh, concrete to people. And they are not uh, desire, they are not gonna desire to give that up. And it's gonna be a fight to, to make that happen. Um, I think middle management has found itself in a pretty weird place. Um, the, the, when you look at like surveys and people asking about, you know, who wants to go back to work and who doesn't, whatever, middle management is, are the people that are most likely to say, we all need to get back in the office. And I think it's because we've equipped or left middle managers to essentially be inner office diplomats more than levers to help people produce. And so I think it will require or has begun to require a reset. Either we need middle management to be a lever to help people produce, not just to navigate company politics and whatnot, uh, or those people can just be aligned to, to providing direct value. So in this, we had a similar situation in my company where we had multiple middle managers that were doing uh, middle manager stuff. And 
as we went through this, we just, we just didn't need one of them anymore. And it wasn't, nobody had done anything wrong. It was just, we just didn't need it as much anymore. And I've talked to a lot of my colleagues that are also like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with my middle managers. I know they provide value, but it seems to have been diminished. And so I think a, a real thought about what is, what is it we want and expect from a middle manager and how can we coach them and lead them to get to that place is something that we're all gonna have to, uh, to consider. Um, and a pretty cool thing, although a weird thing, and I'll share my experience here, is that now the whole world is, you know, your hiring pool. And I, I think everybody's bumper stickered that to death, but this has been true for us for 14 years and we've never done anything with it. Like we've always been able to, it didn't really matter where anybody was. And yet we mostly just hired people in Atlanta and, and people in New York. Um, and we recently started, we just were like, this is crazy. We could hire the best, we could hire anybody from anywhere. Um, for us, it's the US, but call it the world, whatever. And uh, what we've noticed, but I think will change is people look for jobs locally. So we don't get hardly nearly as many applicants for jobs where it's kind of all across the country because they're really like, well, where are you? And I think people are starting to change for that and they're seeing that they demand and want a remote work environment. And so it will become more natural for them to look for jobs that are, that are basically anywhere. So I think it's a time that can be seized in trying to figure out, wow, if I could have 50 times the hiring pool I do right now, what might that mean for my company? And how can I go after and recruit those, those people? Because I still think most people are not looking they're still looking locally. It is still kind of a reflex to look locally and to advertise locally for positions. So I think where we are is all of us as business leaders have to either resist, adapt, or leverage this new world of work. Um, and I don't say resist like snarky. I, I think there are legitimate reasons that people and certain workplaces would want to resist uh, a move to a, like a more remote workplace. But I think it's important to consider that there are going to be costs in doing that. Uh, and so there's a cost to that resistance. It may be, it may be worth it, but it may not be worth it. Um, adapting, which I think is great, which is what I think almost everybody has done. We've all kind of adapted to this um, and that's good. Um, but I think that if, if we're intentional about it, we can leverage the new world of work, at least until it becomes the normal world of work and everybody's on equal footing. But that is probably a ways away. Um, okay, so what people are saying basically is all things equal. All things equal, I wanna work from home. Or all things equal, I wanna work in an, an autonomous workplace, okay? And all of a sudden, the thing has been removed and it's like, oh, this really can be done. Like there's no, there's no necessarily a reason that this can't be done. And so when people say all things equal, that means you either can give them what they want or you have to give them something else that's more valuable. And maybe that is you have the most amazing product or you develop the most amazing technology and it's worth it. You know, if you're building Apple car, that just might be cool enough that you're, you're willing to go to work. But for most people, all things equal is gonna have to be counterbalanced with money. So people are saying in surveys, which I don't think is what will happen, but what they're saying is they would be willing to take a pay cut to continue working autonomously, okay? I doubt that will happen. I think the nominal rigidity of wages will just keep that the same. And what will happen instead is that employers that don't do that will have to raise their wages. Either way, it's the same thing. The cost of being a non-autonomous work environment uh, will go up and we'll all need to consider is the, is the value of that worth it? Are the intangibles that, that we're getting from that worth it? Um, in my Yale group and other groups we talk about, like I hear a lot, like there's just something about coming to the office. You know, it's just, there's something about it. And I, I know that, I mean, I also experienced that, that there is something cool about it and there is something valuable about it. Um, what we're gonna have to figure out though, is how valuable. You know, like this, this is very much like handwritten letters or vinyl or stick shift cars. There is a certain value to it, um, but there's a real cost to it. And so for most people, for most music, they don't have vinyl. For some people, all of their music is vinyl. And for a, some group of people, some of their music is vinyl, but the cost and 
weight of having to have everything be vinyl is just not worth it most of the time to most people. It's really hard to play vinyl in the car and all this other stuff. And so the, I want everybody in the workplace at all times because there's a certain something there and there's serendipitous interactions is true, but it will have a much higher cost than it's had in the past. And so it's something I think uh, worthy of being uh, weighed as you're thinking about um, implementing row. So um, I will just share a little bit about my experience in implementing row. I have other friends who've implemented row as well. So I'll kind of be mashing in their experiences as well. Uh, and then we can just talk about it however you want to talk about it. Um, I do think that in all of this, we need to be proceeding intentionally and building something for the new world and not the old one. So it may, to, may be that you build the exact same thing that you had in 2019. I think that's unlikely. And I think the that we as leaders need to be uh, not reflexive and we need to be intentional and consider the work environment uh, that we want to build and create. If you're thinking about doing it, uh, even thinking about it, not even gonna do it, uh, I think you need to announce your intention. Um, I don't think if you just let it happen that anyone will really know it's happening. There's so much going on. You don't know if you're being remote because you have to or you want to or anything else. So. If you don't talk about it and let people know it's happening, I don't think they'll know and you won't sort of get the, the credit and the input that you're gonna want for it. Um, and you may just be able to keep some people who are on the fence, people who maybe think you're not gonna, that you're not interested in doing this and maybe looking, maybe like, oh, are we thinking about doing this? Well then, okay, I'd like to hear that out. I mean, I like working here. I just don't wanna work here if I have to go to work every day. Um, what we did, and this is a long time ago, but I think it really worked pretty well. And I think it is, is a, a, we try to approach a lot of things this way actually is, is a three month trial. So when I first brought this to my team and I brought it to them, not them to me, uh, I was like, I thought I would be like carried off, you know, like John Madden Super Bowl style on people's shoulders and everyone would just be like, great, we're doing it. Um, but I had a lot of resistance um, and the good kind of resistance, people being, concerned, like, how would this work? How would we know we were getting work done? You know, and all that stuff. And so as we talked about it, more and more people were on board, um, but we, we didn't really know what it would or could look like. And so we just said, let's just drive for three months, you know, and let's just regroup in three months. Uh, we did that in person, but you know, like, let's just regroup in three months and see how we feel it's going. You know, in our case, we were probably two months into it and nobody was going back but it's entirely possible that you'll learn things about whatever you're trying to design that you don't want to be permanent and you don't want it to feel like you're taking anything away. You just, it gives you some flexibility there to, to build something and make mistakes without it feeling like you're giving something and then taking it away. It also, I found that resistors let down their guard. If you're convinced it's not going to work, and it's a three month trial, you know, you can kind of fold your arms and smugly think to yourself, well, this thing's gonna disintegrate in three months. Now, all those resistors actually enjoy autonomy as well. So the, that didn't really turn into much of anything, but it just made them feel like they didn't have to keep fighting. It's just a three month trial. There's nothing we can't get through for three months. Um, one thing I see now, and I'm not gonna talk a lot actually about the technology, I mean, I'm happy to, in questions and answers or whatever, talk about the technology, but you know, you've all been thrust into most of this technology already. So two years ago, I'd have been telling you about Zoom and Slack. You don't need to know about that anymore. But one thing I see a lot of is people taking weird paths with software that aren't uh, commensurate with the money they're paying. So for example, there's Teams and Slack. And a lot of times the reason people will use Teams, for example, is because it's included and it's free. Um, but this is a $4 a month piece of software if you choose to pay for it. And it's a piece of software that people will spend all, uh, all day in. We use Slack, I have, we love Slack, and I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it is different. Um, and so I think people get a little hung up on costs of things that are rounding errors. You know, If you're gonna pay someone $75,000 a year and you're gonna worry about $52 a year in software, it would have to hardly have any effect to be worth $4 a month. Uh, it's surely less than just the amount of ground up wasted coffee that was left in your office two years ago every week. So think about the tools you want because this will now be, if you choose to go more, more remote, 
this is going to be the office. And so like in our case, we choose Slack because it's beautiful and it lets people express themselves better, we think, than other chat tools. Not a pitch for Slack, just a pitch to think about not overthinking the price of something when it divided into the cost of a given employee is a non, you know, a non-entity amount of money. Uh, we see this a lot with computers too, like, and this is, you know, something that we do, but basically we'll be like, hey, here's the laptop we spec, and then someone will come back and be like, hey, I found this one for $400 less at Best Buy, you know, and it's kind of crappy, and it's like, man, this would be a three-year tool. It's $400 for someone you're spending $75,000 a year on. That's $225,000. Like, that's a weird place to try to shave off 400 bucks if it's going to make them a little bit more productive or even just a little happier or even just not think you're cheap. I mean, there's a lot of little things and, and the, the amount of money that people spend on tools is often so small that you could just get the very best ones and it, and it would be a non-factor a non financially. Row in particular, um, but I think all of what we've kind of gone through has shifted to needing to build workplaces around people. So uh, I had to actually kind of rethink about how do we think about this because we've been doing it a long time. But really it, it was a shift over a long period of time, but we think of each person kind of like you would think about a customer. So you might sell a product or a service or whatever, and you have some basic guidelines around that. You know, if you buy Petra, they want to do four sessions a year and two coaching sessions and whatever that is, but then they tailor that to you as, as a customer. Your experience with Petra is not the same as my experience with Petra, okay? And I don't need the same things that you need and vice versa. Well, this is the same thing with, with teammates. And so when you have less rules and less things that are designed to make everybody have the exact same outcome, you really can spend that time and energy thinking about each person and creating the best work environment that you can for each individual. And this is kind of goes back to what I think the role of middle management uh, really should be and needs to be, which is creating that environment. Um, you know, we think about it as fair but tailored. What you need this year is not what you'll need next year, and what your coworker needs next year is not what you need this year, and so forth. And so if everybody feels like they're going to be treated like an individual and their needs are going to be taken into effect, we found they just worry a whole lot less about everything being exactly, did I get this many days, did they get to this many days, and so forth. Um, so we don't think everything has to be perfectly equal because no two people are the same. People do need to, of course, feel like they're being uh, treated fairly. This was like, we've raced up and down this a thousand times in 10 years or whatever, which is how much, you know. Uh, overall, I would say principally, trust begets trust and as few rules as possible about how people should spend their time has the highest return. Each new rule creates a new loophole to be exploited uh, and it creates natural resistance. And when I say exploited, I don't mean like people are necessarily malevolent. I mean that the more you, if you give someone a maze and there's multiple paths to getting to the end, they will find one that maybe you didn't want them to take. And then you're like, oh, I better change the maze and whatever. So the more times you do that, there's like a multiplier effect and everybody does it. Like if you've ever had sick days or PTO days, navigating, am I really sick? Is it a mental health day? Just all this stuff, it comes very, very naturally. And so we found the more trust we extend, the better results that we get, which makes us want to extend more and more and more trust. I mean, we actually have probably reduced rules over those 14 years uh, and rather than having added rules. Um, so kind of back to the question, of will, will row or a hybrid workplace, whatever you want to call it, will that work for you? Um, and I don't mean this snarky, but I, I think that something that people need to think about or we all need to think about is the, is the negative question, which is what is the cost of not trying? You know, taking the status quo cost and the new possibilities, sorry, my hands aren't where they're supposed to be, and comparing those, those costs. Usually what we do with a new idea is we just chip away at the new idea and there's kind of this presumption that the old idea is sort of like perfect and that's the one that has to be compared to. But if you put both work styles on paper and measure those costs, you know, psychological, financial and, and otherwise, you may end up finding uh, something that, uh, that you didn't expect. Uh, so that is, that is my thing. 
Um, and I'll sort of put that up for discussion. I'm happy to answer any, any questions you've got. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we had a couple questions come in. The first one says, will you share a couple of ways or tools to use to reset the way middle managers approach leading their teams in a row? Yeah, so, um, well, I have a, a, a colleague, friend, uh, who's just started a, a, a software company called Murmur. It's in private beta right now. Um, he wrote a book called a, a Brand New Work. His name's Aaron Dignan. I actually don't care. Or Brave New Work, something like that. Anyway, if you look him up, Eric, Aaron Dignan, uh, he's also built software around this, which is about creating agreements between teams. So one of the biggest tool that we probably use isn't like a piece of software or whatever. It's the tool of decentralizing and letting teams sort of police themselves. So when we first started doing this, I remember thinking, well, I kind of know who's not going to make it. You know, we had this normal traditional work environment. Everybody, I don't say punch the clock, but you know, everybody came to work and, um, and I thought there were some people that, that wouldn't be able to sort of handle the autonomy. Uh, I was right in about half those cases and I was, I was wrong in about half those cases. But the one thing I did see was that there was a massive shift. Uh, no one was going to let anyone else screw this up for them. And the, the, what I had seen previously was people would sort of wait for management to do something. And what I saw sort of after the fact is they started taking kind of ownership of what was happening in their teams to themselves. So, so that was a big, that's just sort of a big tool that isn't, isn't a, a, you know, a tool per se. Um, I'll say that there's no tool that you're probably not using now if you've, if you've been in America for the last year, but I will say that, you know, Slack or Teams or whatever you choose to use in, in Slack, there's, there's some work to be done in there. Um, and what's weird about it is, is, is that's one of those places where more is less. So when we first started using Slack, we were like a beta tester, I don't know, seven years ago. You know, we wanted as few channels as possible because we wanted people not, not to get distracted. Um, but what actually happened, of course, is then everybody's in those few channels and everything goes everywhere. So we now have hundreds of channels and I'm not, I don't even know what half of them are. And a lot of them have taken the place of what used to happen uh, in the physical workplace, just talking about nothing, you know, TV shows or food or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, that's just a natural part of, of a workplace. It's a social environment. Uh, and so we've just let those really, you know, basically expand and, and, and get more granular, which actually kind of paradoxically turns into a lot less alerts and a lot less crap you have to be a part of because any channel you're in is much more specific and you can decide do I belong here? And if I don't belong here, I'll either turn off alerts or I'll just get out of the room entirely. Whereas like when we first started, I was in all 12 rooms because we thought smaller would be better. So. Okay, then we have another question that came in that said, any good examples of companies that have been, have seen success creating a hybrid model of road? Yeah, um, a lot. So, well, so I'll just kind of take it back to when this first started, and they actually since backtracked on it, so I don't know what you want to make of that. But this whole thing started at Best Buy, and when I first read about it, it was like there was this Business Week article in 2005, probably. And I just thought, man, this just seems like super cool and uh, work utopia. But then I was like, I didn't have a bad workplace. I didn't have a problem to solve. And I was like, yeah, they have a lot of resources. So this, I don't know. And uh, then uh, my friend Craig, well, he wasn't my friend then. He was just a guy I met at EO. Um, he ran a small ad agency, like 10 people, which was a lot closer to what my company looked like. And I was talking to him about it. He goes, oh yeah, we're a row. And I was like, wait, what? You know? And so I made him like, tell me all about it. And, uh, and he came in and talked to my team and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, Matchstick, which is an ad agency here, Best Buy had success with it for 10 years. They had a new CEO come in, in the great recession. He took it away. Uh, you know, they've since been successful. So I don't, you know. They were successful both times and they've had big flops both times. So it's, uh, I can't really tell you the Best Buy experience, particularly. Um, Guild Quality is another company. Uh, they make uh, like a surveying software for, for contractors. They've been real successful in it. And then there's like bigger, you know, bigger name types of companies. So Automatic, who makes WordPress, they've been remote, um, which, you know, I mean, the two are pretty close. They've been remote only since day one. Um, clearly WordPress has had a lot of success. 
um, Zapier. Uh, they make like a tool that interchanges, you know, multiple pieces of software and lets them talk to each other. They've been remote since day one. They're a great resource. Um, when I send out my like list of links, they've built this super cool, very transparent, um, you know, remote uh, workforce. And they talk a lot about tools. I mean, because that's pretty advantageous to them. A lot of those tools, you know, use Zapier on the back end, but they just share a lot about their experiences. Um, and so they've, they've had a lot of success with that as well. There's also last is there's a, so the, the, there's two women that founded this, their names are uh, Callie and Jody. Um, and they left Best Buy after they sort of started this whole thing. And they started like a consulting firm that I think still exists today. And that's goro.com. So they have a lot of case studies. They have a lot of tools. They do, you know, consulting and seminars, like, you can think of them as sort of a Petra, but for row. So there's a lot of, lot of resources that they have. They have a, I mean, they have a doctrine, you know, uh, we do some of their stuff and we don't do some of their stuff. I mean, they, they have a, they are the leaders of a movement and they're very, you know, strongly opinionated about every aspect of that. Um, but they're, they're a tremendous resource and there's lots and lots of companies they've led through that. All right, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, Gabriel says, how do you recreate the benefits of water cooler slash hallway run-in conversations? So I guess we talked about recreating the conversations. How do you recreate the benefits? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure that you can. I mean, that is, there is something special about uh, people being together. I mean, you know, getting a drink on Zoom, which I'm guessing you've all done, uh, is not the same as getting a drink in a bar, which I'm guessing you all miss. Uh, so I can't, you can't recreate it. And I think about like, instead of trying to recreate the old thing, what are new things that could be done? And I, I don't actually have the exact answers for that. So that's disappointing. Um, but a big tool for us in that has been Slack and it does work differently than water cooler conversations. There are sometimes less serendipitous interactions. Uh, and some of those need to be more intentional uh, because people will just gravitate toward the groups that they're attracted to. But what we have found is a lot of people are attracted to a lot of different things that you wouldn't think maybe would cross pollinate. You know, you think, oh, well, gamers, that's just going to be people who are, you know, 23 to 27 and male. But actually, a whole swath of my company are gamers from very old to very young, male and female. And so they actually, they forged new relationships that they never would have forged in our normal work environment. They just probably would never have known to talk about that kind of stuff. And so I think about like the benefits to me are cross pollination, people connecting with people that they don't maybe wouldn't normally connect with in work. Um, there's actually, I'll put this in the links as well. There's a study that just came out. They kind of did a global study about Microsoft before and after the pandemic. Um, and that was one of the big changes. There was more communication in between groups that kind of had reason to talk and there was less communication between people that normally wouldn't have reason to talk. And so there, I think we need to figure out ways to do that. The one that, that we've done, I stole from my friend, Jeff, um, is he did these three on, this is before, you know, pandemic or whatever, but he did these three on one sessions where he would basically pluck three employees at random and then they'd go have lunch with him. Uh, so I started doing this about two years ago. And you know, mostly now they've been on Zoom and stuff. But what's been cool about it is if you have a one-on-one -on -one with someone who's maybe down the authority chain from you, a lot of stuff they're not gonna tell you, you know? But when there's three people there and one person kind of tentatively brings up a work problem or an idea, and there's two other people kind of there to vouch for them, it kind of destroys your level of, you know, social authority in that group and lets people speak a lot more freely. And so when I've done that, I've gotten all sorts of stuff I don't think I would have would have gotten before. And those work totally perfectly great on Zoom. I mean, those didn't have to be in person to, to recreate that. So I think some of the stuff we're doing is skeuomorphic, meaning we're trying to make the old office, we're trying to do things that feel like the old office. And that's how everything works at first, you know, like all computer calendars looked like wood, you know, when they first came out, because that was what people thought calendars looked like. And I think we're going to start, you know, creating more and more ways to, to, they won't look the same, you know, TV won't be just radio with pictures and so forth. All right. We've got three more. We're going to squeeze them in here. 
Um, this one says, it feels like the closer you move to row, the more team members have requests or policies and guidelines, tips for overcoming the need for policies from the team. God, that's totally true. Like I get more, I, I always thought it would be leadership that would want more policies or whatever, um, because people just, you know, it's, it's a lot more work to be autonomous, to be honest. Um, I mean, honestly, the biggest tool we use for that is to just push that back. Well, what do you want to have happen? Why would you care about this being a policy? How much time do you feel like you need and so forth? And so when we kind of push that back, people give reasoned and rational responses. So I've never had somebody say, uh, I have a, a big life event and they're like, I'm not sure what to do. Should I take a leave of absence? Can I just go, you know, and then us at and say, well, what do you think you need and have them just blurt out some horrible thing that's just never ever happened and so the longer we've done this the more people i think have come to understand like we're probably not going to make a policy for that you know everyone there's so many unique situations they all kind of even out in the end and so when we when we just kind of push it back and say well why a lot of times the reason is I feel like we should have one because what if someone else does something else? And it's like, don't worry about someone else. Like what's gonna work for you? And so that, that is a muscle and it kind of gets exercised and new people come in and they come from different work environments. And so this is not something that we, you can sort of turn on and turn off. It needs to be constantly nurtured, just like the old style of, of work environment. But I've just kind of found that if we just dig a little deeper and ask a few questions about what it is they're trying to accomplish the need for policy, usually, not always. I mean, there are, you know, there's laws and regulations and stuff that we have to deal with as well, but they tend to fade away more, more often than not. All right, and then we have a question that says, we are working on our own guidelines for remote employees. It's a new thing for us, and it's a new thing for us to have 100% remote workers. Are there some type of templates to pull from, or can you share what guidelines you have for Ripple? Yeah, I don't have like a great template, but I will say like, if, if you're gonna send out like an email after, I have some links of companies that have documented this way better. I mean, I'm not great at documenting and stuff. So that's just not like, I don't have like a template for that, that kind of thing. What that'd I will say is when- What's that? I said that'd be super helpful to include. Yeah, uh, but like Zapier and WordPress and these other companies have done a lot of stuff around it. What they're usually doing is saying, Okay, here's something we found in the pandemic more than we had noticed before, which was that it was probably true before too, but we just weren't paying attention properly, is we have to, you can't wait for the information to come to you when everybody's remote, like middle managers and regular leaders and everybody can see body language and arguments and things like that when you're in person that you just really can't see when everyone is remote. And so uh, what our team has done a lot more of is they go get it, ask, 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 you know, proactively talk to people to figure out, you know, what it is they want to do. I also do not have a rule. I mean, for health reasons, we've had this, but like in general, we don't have some rule that says you can't go to the office. And so again, it's what's going to help you do your best work. And sometimes teams are like, Hey man, we, we just got to meet in person, you know, like, we got to whiteboard this out or we got to go have a drink or we need to just all be together today and like there's no crime in that i mean i'm not out here to say one should never have an office and no one should ever see each other uh in person um but when we kind of push that down to the teams they tend to i've found that like our support team has kind of a different way of doing this than our projects team and different than our marketing team and they tend to kind of build their own uh their own like rhythms around that but again it's it's not perfect it's full of messy, messy stuff, so. All right, and then last question we have time for, it said, any examples of row working in a manufacturing environment where much of the staff needs to work in person at the same time? I personally don't have examples of that just because I, that's not my thing. But I know that like Callie and Jody, the Go Row people, they have a lot of examples of that because there's, there's a bunch of, so like in my case, nobody's exempt and or everybody's exempt and you know, so we don't have a lot of stuff with like someone who physically needs to be there to do the work and we don't have a lot of stuff around hourly workers and stuff like that. Those are real considerations that, you know, there's laws and regulations partly that you just can't get around. And so again, it's as much freedom and flexibility as can be managed to get the work done. With shifts, I can give you a little bit of experience that we've had, which is 
you know, like I said, like most of our work still has to happen between nine and five. That's when people have computer problems, you know, because that's when they're working. So it's not like everybody can just choose to work at three o'clock. But what we did find is that there's a bunch of stuff that actually, even within roles that needed mostly to work in a time block, there's a bunch of stuff that really didn't, a bunch of admin stuff and, and, and other stuff like that. But all that said, you're not going to be able to manufacture your products without people being there. And that's where that kind of fairness thing comes into play. Like some people will have to be there and others will not have to be there. And there's not some necessary justice in making a marketing person sit at a desk from nine to five because the person who assembles something has to be there from nine to five, even though there's kind of a, I don't know, sort of a social sense to that or whatever. But I would say the Jody and Callie people, they work with government agencies, you know, manufacturers, all kinds of places to help navigate where this can work and kind of where this just, you know, you're not going to be able to work from home and make a thing. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for that information. It was really great. Um, and thank you guys for attending. You'll receive a recap in the next 24 hours. That'll include all the resources we've been chatting about and then a link to rewatch and share this webinar with your team. Um, be sure to check out petrocoach.com and click on our events tab to see all of our other upcoming workshops and webinars. You can also view our previous ones. And then as always, if you have any further questions or we can provide some additional help, please reach out at info at petrocoach.com. And Mike, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a great day, guys.